Great. Well, listen, uh, thanks for welcoming me back, having me back. Five years was a long time. Lots, lots happened in five years, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share a little bit uh, of it uh, with you all this afternoon. Um, when Mark reads the introduction, it always makes me think that I can't hold a job in Washington, which is, you know, which is part of the part of the uh, 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 professional hazard there. Um, I'll make a couple of comments on the on the presentation. Is that part? Of, and then and then I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about where our industry is going. Uh, give you all a glimpse of the future a little bit, and then um, and talk about how that relates to the uh, the merger announcement that we made now three four weeks ago uh, with T-Mobile, and then we'll talk a little bit about the regulatory process that we have to go through. Um, and that uh, our team in Washington is engaged in, you know, even as we speak. Um, and then I want to leave some time for uh, questions and, and hear what's on, on your mind. And I can talk to you about uh, the business, the business of Washington, the business of lobbying, politics, who's going to win the next presidential uh, election, and anything else. So just on the paper, um, it, it, it is, it's a, uh, a difficult task, to, uh, Ryan, to... Uh, kind of capture where the industry has been and where it's going. And it certainly has been, as uh, Professor Crane said, a very dynamic industry. I've had the ability to witness a lot of it. Um, when I was on the Hill, uh, I worked on the 96 Act, um, what the legislation that ultimately became the 96 Act. So I've seen it kind of from that, that uh, portion of it. And then seeing how that act has played out uh, over the last uh, number of years and what the industry has done. And it's really, it's been a fascinating uh, look at kind of being at the center of the policy and the politics and the technology and the business piece of this. And, um, uh, and telecommunications has been kind of an exciting piece. And we were talking at lunch, I mean, just the applications. Uh, how many are seniors here? So when you were freshmen, there was no applications market, right? There were no apps. Um, that's about a three and a half year old marketplace, right? So what you take for granted today on your iPhone, or hopefully your iPhone, right? <laughs> hopefully an AT&T iPhone, um, uh, you know, didn't exist when you entered Lafayette. So, and now that market is on its way to being a $30 billion market, right? And um, so that's how fast things uh, change and how quickly uh, things can change in the business. And, you know, as we, as we like to say, you, you were kind of at the front end of it too. We're kind of at the front end of where we're going. Um, so trying to capture it. Um, so, but a couple things that I wanted to kind of trends, and you, you highlight this in your, in your paper, and I think we all know this, which is the death of the wireline business, right? Our business on the wireline side is shrinking, you know, I think seven, eight, nine, ten percent a year, year over year, pretty steadily. So, uh, and it's pretty much a generational uh, thing, right? Anybody? have a wireline in their dorm that they use or apartment that they use, right? You have your cell phone, right? So um, does anybody have a wireline? Anybody, when was the last time anybody used a wireline phone that wasn't at your parents' house? Right, so that's my point, right? So that business is, that, that business is on its way down, uh, shrinking. Everybody wants uh, mobility. You see here um, the website that we've named kind of to inform people about this transaction is uh, mobilizeeverything.com. So anything that you want to know about this transaction is there. But the broader message is everything's going to be, mo you know, our company is pushing to mobilize everything. People want uh, all their information available to them, all their ability to communicate, all their ability to social network. They want it with them all the time, wherever they are. And uh, so that's what we're about. So the wireline business is uh, on its way down. And so, and the long distance business kind of with it, just... Uh, as Mark said, I went to AT&T in 1998. It was a $25 billion business for AT&T, the long distance business. By the time uh, we were sold to SPC, which I think was 2002, 2003, so five years later, it was a $5 billion business. So $20 billion of value just vaporized right out of the company, right? And that's one of the reasons that we, we were sold to SPC. Um, so, uh, so the long distance business, and, and again, Kind of the wireless business, wireless substitution really took that business, um, you know, right out from right out from under the, uh, you know, that business model was done. So AT and T had to find new businesses, and really, um, uh, and so that's been kind of the wireless business. The other thing, um, so you hit that in the paper, and that's 
you know, that's a very significant trend. And then the kind of the three trends that we always like to talk about in the business, and you get some of this in a paper too. So the wired to wireless we just talked about, um, going from narrow band world to a, to a uh, broadband world. So there was, uh, you know, dial-up, AOL was like the master of dial-up. When I came off the hill in uh, 1998, I went out to go interview with a then fledgling two-year-old company called America Online. Um, they had gone from 100 employees to 800 employees in the last in the previous 12 months. They were out on Route 7, yeah. uh, uh, Tyson's Corner. Um, I sat in the uh, sat in the lobby, and uh, the only people in suits in the lobby were people either interviewing for jobs or the investment bankers that were trying to give them money. Everybody else was jeans and a t-shirt. Um, and they made their living, right? They're the ones who popularized, popularized uh, online dial-up services, right? Um, let's see, <clears throat> You've Got Mail, right? Old movie with a relatively old movie, right? So that was America Online. Um, so those guys are gone, right? The dial-up world uh, kind of came and went, uh, and it was replaced by the always-on broadband world. And so uh, the industry has been working hard to make sure that broadband connections get in everybody's house, you know, faster, bigger, uh, fatter pipes. Um, most of the uh, country has a choice of two broadband providers now, cable, and then your local phone company. Uh, some places we've got three. Um, uh, but most of the country is covered. There's still some areas, uh, you know, rural areas, some underserved areas that are still being uh, worked out. And actually the FCC in Washington trying to figure out the subsidy system for broadband uh, penetration in those areas. Um, and then a third trend that we talk about is, you know, analog to digital or digital IP. And sometimes in this class I've done kind of the top 10 technology trends. And the, the kind of the bottom of that list is IP will eat everything. Um, and so that's internet protocol. Uh, and what IP does is it allows you to send all the applications in bits and bytes, right? So voice, video, and data. Um, and so what IP has done is it's merged all those networks into an internet, into an internet world. And, um, and that has resulted in, you know, a great reordering of, uh, of the value chain of the internet, um, but also from the networking side. So we used to have a voice network, we used to have a data network, now we have it all one network and it's all IP. So from, a, you know, the economics of it, it's just too compelling. Um, so that all networks are uh, on, the, on the way to be IP. And you were talk, uh, I think we talked about services in the cloud, so that's all um, uh, allowed through uh, IP technology, right? Um, so IPs lead everything. And, you know, there are those who think that, um, uh, you know, we're just kind of at the front end of the disruption that IP will bring to the technology telecom industry. For example, uh, the clouds have become, you know, the cloud, this internet hosting capability in the cloud. So you already, you know, we have uh, applications now where your pictures are essentially on the internet. People can, you know, Flickr.com, so on. People can access your pictures. Um, we're starting to see Amazon roll out kind of a music library, right, on the cloud. Um, you know, it's certainly not hard to envision that all your entertainment will be kept on the cloud. And I think that this is kind of where the industry's going, so all your entertainment content, you know, your pictures, your videos, your uh, music, kept somewhere on the cloud and you'll be able to access it for, with any device that you've got in your pocket. Or, you know, your, uh, your iPad, your laptop. And so you don't have to kind of cart it around with you on a storage device. Um, you'll be able to access, as long as you have an internet connection, you'll be able to access it. And then really the issue then just becomes a property rights issue, right? Who's got the, uh, who's got the copyright, who's got the trademark for that? Um, so you're really kind of talking a, a licensing issue. But in terms of access, you can keep your, um, you know, whatever your content is that you're worried about, off-site, hosted, your house can burn down, you know, everything. And so what does that mean? So that means your DVD player at home, probably out the window, right? You don't need it anymore. You're going to be able to access it through your internet connection at your, so that's where folks kind of see this uh, going. And then so, so that's in the wired, right, the broadband side of the world. But now on the wireless side, um, where we're pushing for is wireless broadband, right? And so 
Uh, we're all on the wireless side, we're all busily engaged in getting faster, broader networks on the wireless side. And that actually uh, is what leads to um, the merger that we announced uh, a month ago. I'll stop there. Any quick question? Anybody? Yeah. Um, with respect to the cloud computing, how do you predict that uh, the government or the private companies will yes. really like, take care of these? Yeah, that's a good question. That's an excellent question. So, um, so one of the uh, one of the uh, questions and we're dealing with this on the federal level is some concern about it at the state level. You have a host of bad things that can happen to you on the internet, right? So privacy is is one. You know, spam is another. Um, security issues are, are a third, right? So there's kind of bad things that can happen. Um, and so as an internet service provider, <coughs> communications provider, the technology providers, we're all interested at some level, right, in keeping the bad down, right? Because the more you, the more you trust the platform, the more content you're going to put on the platform. You're, gonna, you're not going to put your health records on the platform if you're worried about, you know, privacy issues. You're not going to put your financial banking records on that platform if you're worried about, um, you know, security issues. So. Uh, so we all have an interest, right, in kind of securing this internet ecosystem. Um, but, the, but, but the question is, so how do you do it? So, uh, and there are a lot of issues that kind of flow from that. So is that a federal, you know, uh, piece? Is that a self-regulated piece where the industry comes together and kind of figures out a self-regulatory regime? Um, and then you have, you know, law enforcement concerns, for example. Um, you know, there's, uh, this is an issue we're wrestling with in Congress now. There's an Electronic Privacy and Communications Act, EPCA. Um, so EPCA provides a certain set of protections for, um, uh, for uh, uh, electronic communications, right? But EPCA never contemplated <laughs> communications that are being made in the cloud. So the things that you've got off, I just kind of painted this vision of you've got everything stored somewhere in the in a hosting uh, environment. Um, so EPCA never contemplated protecting that stuff there. So your emails that are on your hard drive have a certain level of protections. Your emails that you're storing off on the cloud have, a diff you know, have no protection right now, right? And so the FBI is interested if, they're, if you're under investigation for you know, whatever. So they're interested in making sure that they have access to both the sets of emails. The companies are interested in making sure that we understand, right, what access do we have to give? Do we have to give it for a search warrant? Do we have to give it for, you know, a subpoena? Um, so these are all issues that are, you know, and your question's a great one. They're kind of very real-time issues. Um, and how do you uh, carve out kind of the set of rights that uh, folks have in this environment? <coughs> but also, how do you carve out a, a regulatory regime that gives folks the confidence to be able to use it and know that they're protected um, and know that they're informed about, you know, where their information is going. Yeah? Uh, you touched on cloud computing and the future of the market, and I was just wondering if this technology or technology is going to be seen as more of a direction of the market, or is it a trend that's being traveling to a different trend of technology? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's both, right? I mean, um, I think we were talking at, at lunch uh, earlier about the importance of kind of team collaboration Right, and so one of the things that you can, you see a lot in technology is a bunch of engineers get in a room and they design a product that's a fabulously engineered product, um, but nobody in the marketplace is interested in it at all, right? And, and we've all seen devices like that that come out on the marketplace and they're fabulously engineered devices, but the consumer can't figure out how to use them, right? Um, so it's absolutely both. You need to be able to innovate and come up with the next kind of great mousetrap, but you also need to have customer acceptance of it, right? And so, and the iPhone, right, is a pretty good example uh, of kind of the innovation and the simplicity coming together so that something, you know, was so innovative that it made consumers' lives, you know, very easy, very easy for a consumer to access it and make consumers' lives, you know, kind of a better experience, right? And, and that was, and I've told this story, I think, in this class before. I mean, that was the iPhone, uh, you know, it wasn't the first iteration, right? There was a previous phone, it was called the uh, Razor, which had uh, iTunes, you know, the idea was to put iTunes on a phone, right? It was called the Razor. 
AT&T, we still have warehouses full of the razor, right? It, it didn't work, right? Um, but what it did allow for was the relationship to develop between AT&T, I'm sorry, not the razor, the rocker. The rocker was the name of the phone. Um, but, uh, but what it did allow for was uh, the folks at Apple and the folks at AT&T to create this collaborative relationship um, that allowed uh, them to go forward and ultimately come up with the iPhone. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a good, good question. You can have a you know, fabulously developed engineered product. If nobody's buying it, it's sitting in a warehouse. Um, and the flip side is you can have great innovation if you can't execute then it's just a great idea. Um, so, um, anything else? Anybody else? Yeah. So, that's a good question. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we have an answer for that. Um, and the answer is, um, and people didn't like this, a lot of folks didn't like this in the iPhones case. Um, you come up with an exclusive relationship, right? So we entered into, with Apple, we entered into an exclus exclusive relationship with Apple for, to develop the rocker. Um, they partnered with us. They couldn't, if they partnered with us, nobody else could have the rocker, right, if it came to market. And so the idea would be that uh, we, would, uh, we would share in the upside Right, and we would also share in the downside. So, you um, you socialize the risks a little bit between the two companies. Um, so when the iPhone came along, um, it required a lot of investment on AT and T's part, and obviously it required a lot of investment on on the iPhone's part. Um, so from the AT and T perspective, it was the first phone where you you didn't have to um, uh, you don't you didn't have to activate it at the store. Right, you could take it home and you could plug it into your Apple, and you could activate it through iTunes, right? So that was the first phone. So for AT&T, we had to make a lot of investment to be able to you know, get the back-end systems, the ability to do that. We had to write software and so on and so forth. Um, and and it, you know, at the time, so everybody thinks, oh, you know, it was a great, brilliant business success. At the time, we, we took a lot of criticism, right, for working with Steve Jobs. He'd never, you know, at that point, he'd done the iPod, right? Um, and he'd done iTunes, but he'd never done a phone. He was never, he was never a phone guy. Um, and so uh, he came, he went to Verizon. Verizon had one meeting with him, and that was it. You know, they were done. Because he wanted so much control over the phone, and Verizon was concerned about whether or not the phone would, would run properly on its network. And so they said, you know, sorry, we're not going to be, you know, he went to Sprint, he went to T-Mobile, he went to all the carriers. And uh, AT&T was second in the market at the time, but a little bit hungrier. And, um, and they, you know, it was a, it was a tough uh, negotiation to kind of work out all the, uh, uh, all the pieces of it. And there was an exclusive contract, that, that, uh, an exclusivity period that was much longer than was, um, was typical in the industry at the time. So I think it ended up being five, six years, five, four, four or five years. Um, and at the time, there were probably six-month, eight-month, ten-month exclusivity contracts. So, because AT&T had to make this investment on the back end, um, you know, they wanted to uh, have this contract. And so, you know, in hindsight, it looks like a brilliant move. But at the front end, you know, there was actually contemporaneously there were a lot of, uh, you know, people kind of scratching their head, why was AT&T doing this? Um, but yeah, so you kind of socialize the risk. Um, and in the and in this case, this exclusive contract right was um, the ability to capture more of the upside on a going forward basis. Anything else? All right. Let me run through a couple slides on the merger. So um, how do I move this around? Just down. Um, all right. So I talked about uh, broadband on the wired space. So where everybody wants to go, though, is broadband on the wireless space, right? You know, our industry has done a pretty good job of conditioning folks now in a short amount of time to be able to think that, uh, you know, pretty much everything you can get on your, you know, laptop at home or through a Wi-Fi connection, you now have the expectation that you can get it on, you know, off of the kind of the, wired, the wireless network, right? So if you don't have a Wi-Fi connection and you don't have 
um, a wired connection and you're driving down the road and you pull out your iPad and now you want to watch high definition videos from Netflix on a streaming basis, okay? So, so we're busily uh, investing in fourth generation wireless and fourth generation wireless will give you the speeds, right, to be able to do things like that, high definition video and you're traveling down the road. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, in the lab, the speeds can be up as, you know, 100 megabits per second. Out in the real world, it's probably going to be, you know, 5, 8, 10, 12, you know, depending on kind of conditions and how it all works out. But it all rides on uh, radio spectrum. Radio spectrum is the natural resource of, uh, of the wireless industry. And um, radio spectrum right now, uh, and always has been, is controlled by the U.S. government. It's the federal government, uh, controls all radio spectrum, and you get license <laughs> to be able to use it. Um, and everybody that uses spectrum, radio spectrum in the country, you know, the military, the park service, um, the wireless carriers, the broadcasters, um, everybody has to get a license from the federal government uh, to be able to use that. Um, and uh, the, the governmental use is monitored and uh, controlled by uh, NTIA, the National Telecommunications something Administration, Information Administration, uh, which is in the Commerce Department. And then uh, all the private uses are uh, monitored and overseed by the uh, Federal Communications uh, FCC. So, um, and right now, because of the explosion of wireless services, um, our company and others in the industry are facing a, uh, a radio spectrum crunch, right? We're, uh, we're, we're looking at spectrum exhaustion. Um, and, and why is that, right? And I think you, you probably know. So, I don't know if I have this chart in here. Uh, okay. So this is, um, this is what's happened with, this is mobile data. All right, so, um, so what we're talking about is, uh, you know, voice phone calls. Uh, voice services is how the wireless industry started, right? You were able to call somebody, that was convenient. Um, but really since 2004, 2003, um, data has become a big driver in our industry. And this is the projected growth. Uh, this is actually what's happened. Uh, so 8,000% over the last four years. So anybody know uh, how, why this has been driven? Okay, you got one in your pocket, smartphones, right, iPhone. So used to be pre-2007, really most data was driven by uh, email and texting. And even texting was slow to start in this country. And this is uh, kind of uh, one of my uh, favorite stories. So uh, texting was slow to start in this country. Uh, AT&T um, was a, uh, a sponsor of, uh, uh, not Dancing with the Stars, with um, American, American Idol, Idol right? So you had to text in to vote, right? So people weren't used to texting. But they were sponsored for American Idol. People got used to texting in. American Idol took off. And now everybody kind of figured out, okay. And you can actually, um, you know, when you guys, somebody gets into uh, your master's program and you need a senior thesis to do. So look at uh, kind of texting and the popularity of American Idol. And you'll see that as it became more popular, texting became more popular. And the data streams that flowed from texting in American Idol, that's how kind of texting is a large, large part of how texting took off. So that was like the 2004. But then, um, you know, 2007, we talked about this five-year, four-year exclusivity with the iPhone. So this is what's happened. This is uh, AT&T's network, right? So 8,000%. Um, and then, uh, and then this, is, this is where we think it's going. All right, so eight times to ten, eight to ten times the volume growth over the next five years. So all these applications that are coming on that take take advantage of this, and most of this will be driven by video, some version of video, standard definition video, high definition video, you know, video chat applications, right? So, um, so that's where uh, this is going. All this rides over uh, radio spectrum, and so you can see. So these are all the various applications, right? And then um, this shows you uh, how it's broken up by use. Uh, folks can see this. But um, you know, a big chunk of this is, uh, is video. 
So mobile video will generate 66% of mobile traffic, of mobile data traffic by 2015. So that's from, uh, so 2008 to 2014, we think it's a 12,000% growth, right? What's it ride on? What do you need? Spectrum, right? Radio spectrum, right? So if you're at a certain percent, uh, if you got a certain spectrum portfolio today, I have a certain, you know, AT&T's got a certain bundle of spectrum licenses today. T-Mobile has a certain bundle of spectrum licenses today. Sprint has a certain spectrum licenses. All these licenses, by the way, licenses that we paid for, and they're actually licensed, right? It's not ours, right? They're licenses to use. Um, if we ever go out of business, the spectrum all goes back to uh, the, the U.S. government. But uh, periodically, the FCC will auction these licenses. Um, we go in and bid, and the price goes up, um, and the high, you know, the high winner uh, gets the licenses. So we have a, sp uh, a certain spectrum portfolio. Do you think we put together our spectrum portfolio? The last time there were licenses uh, auctioned were in 2008, right? Uh, so 2008 was the last time. Spectrum license. Do you think in 2008 we put together a spectrum portfolio that anticipated 12,000% uh, growth? Right? And the answer is uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, and so what's the result? So, um, any other country doing as well as we are? And the answer to that is no. Um, so, mobile broadband subscribers, 155 million in the US, Japan's the next closest at 111. Smartphone sales, 100 million in the US, China, 28 and a half million smartphones. Um, and then application downloads, I talked about this, you know, it's a three year, a three and a half year old. So, um, so the US, because we have the most smartphones, because we have the most broad mobile broadband subscribers, we have the most applications. Um, we're leading the world, and we didn't lead the world, you know, 2004, 2005, so this is really the last, you know, five years, five, six years. And then AT&T is leading all these categories. You know, U.S. is ahead of everybody in the world, and AT&T is ahead uh, in the U.S. Um, so AT&T is sitting there. And we're burning through spectrum. Um, so 10 megahertz, we, we deploy our spectrum in 10 megahertz blocks. So during the 2001-2004, uh, so that's voice, right? It would take us 24 months to go through a 10 megahertz block of spectrum. So that was basically you're adding voice customers on a plan. Um, but uh, now we're burning through spectrum in 10 months. All right. So um, uh, so and we're, and we're basically running out of spectrum. And this is you're adding smartphones. More people are using the smartphones. They're using them for more things. Um, and uh, and you know we're running out of the natural resource. Can I just say so yeah. when you say you run out, is that, it, it's just, it drops the call, it slows down, what's the... Dro drops the call, the you can't make the connection. This experience. Right, the quality of the experience for the customer. Um, um, you know, a lot of customers show up. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time kind of building out networks around stadiums, for example. So everybody shows up for a game on Sunday afternoon. People used to have their cell phones, make calls. Hey, I'm at the Super Bowl. <laughs> Now people are, you know, here, look at this picture that I just took of me at the Super Bowl. Um, so that's a data, intent, and now, you know, and now you want real-time video. Hey, I'm, I'm at the Super Bowl. <laughs> and you're doing real-time video back to, you know, whoever was unlucky enough not to get the Super Bowl. So, um, so yeah, if you don't have the spectrum, and you don't have the infrastructure, you've got to have both. But if you don't have the spectrum, then you can't um, provide the robust services. Um, so... So what's a company like AT&T to do? Um, the government's not uh, auctioning off spectrum uh, anytime soon. Um, one of my other jobs is trying to get legislation through uh, this year, next year, that'll, that'll, free up, um, that'll that will free up some spectrum that the government can then turn around to do it, to auction it off. Um, and the FCC has uh, identified, you know, they're aware of the spectrum issue, right? This is not a secret. So they've identified, um, they have a plan to free up kind of 500 megahertz of spectrum over a number of years to get it out into the marketplace. Um, the Obama administration, um, this is from the State of the Union, the Obama administration um, 
has identified this spectrum uh, crunch. And uh, so they are uh, uh, working hard to, uh, uh, they have a plan that was in his budget and, um, and it would basically, um, you know, uh, provide the broadcasters with a way to get rid of their spectrum, which would then be repurposed and put it out to the wireless industry. Um, so there's legislation that's pending in Congress now um, to try to make all that happen. Um, the problem with it is even if that bill passed tomorrow, it would take uh, 18 months, 24 months, maybe 36 months for the current license holders to exit off the spectrum. And then once it then it moves go to auction, and then you know the wireless guys would buy it, and then we would go build out the infrastructure, right? So it's you're looking at at best kind of a three, four, five year process. We're going through 10 megahertz of spectrum every 10 months now. So in our busiest markets, we're going to have spectrum exhaust before. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Spectrum? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that doesn't hold out much. Yeah. No. It helps. It helps. So, uh, an example: uh, Times Square, right? Times Square, New York. We turned Times Square into essentially a big hotspot for Wi-Fi. A lot of people come to Times Square. A lot of those folks are using their smartphones. So we're not using radio spectrum there. We're using, you know, the same technology that you have here in this building but we're using it for Times Square. So that gives us, that frees up radio spectrum in Times Square. Um, we're building out hot spots uh, in other kind of busy. Um, and then you can repurpose, uh, you know, you, you can uh, build more towers, right? So if you have two towers and they can serve a certain number of folks, now you put another tower in here, then that increases your capacity. And, and that is actually one of the reasons why uh, is another reason why we're buying T-Mobile. So, so the T-Mobile, so in, in many respects, right, this T-Mobile acquisition is a self-help acquisition, right? And T-Mobile is in the same place, right? T-Mobile has smartphones. They have 34 million customers. Those 34 million customers are making the change to smartphones. Um, so their customers uh, were facing spectrum exhaustion too. Um, so we, we have to pass two tests on the regulatory, to get over the regulatory hurdles, there are two tests that we have to pass. Um, one is the public interest test, and that's administered by the FCC, the Federal Communications. Um, on the 24th, uh, I'm sorry, on the 21st, in two days, we will file our public interest application at the FCC. Um, and we will lay out the case as to why this merger is in the public interest. And the public interest is, that's in the statute it's not really well defined, um, but we have to pass this public interest test. And then the other piece that we have to pass is the antitrust laws. In the antitrust laws, we have to jump over the, uh, 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 the hurdle over at the Department of Justice. And in the antitrust laws, um, it's basically, is this good? Is this merger good or bad for, comp for competition and competitors? Right? So there are two tests. So our public interest test will be um, a couple of things. Our, our argument, uh, you'll read about it in two days. I'll give you a little preview here. Um, so our argument will be, one, uh, will be um, uh, our customers and T-Mobile's customers are going to be better off. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, if you combine their spectrum portfolio and our spectrum portfolio and their networks and our networks together, you're actually going to end up in a situation where kind of two plus two equals five. Um, we'll be able to use the two networks together more efficiently than we would use, than, than the two separate networks could be used on their own. Um, and we'll be able to use the two pieces of spectrum holdings better um, to service our customers, their customers. Um, and we'll also give their customers a path to fourth generation broadband. Um, T-Mobile uh, had, a, had, a, had a decision, so, uh, you know, why, does, why is T-Mobile selling, right? And so T-Mobile, as Ryan said, is a subsidiary of a subsidiary. Deutsche Telekom, which is a German telephone company, they're 30% owned by the German government. So they had a decision. They had this asset in the U.S., and the asset um, was fourth in the marketplace. Um, and 
all the competitors in the U.S. were moving up to the fourth generation, right? So for T-Mobile, they said, you know, we have a choice here. We can invest another $10 billion into our infrastructure, try to find some more spectrum, build out our network, $10 billion in our infrastructure, and uh, stay in the U.S. market. Um, because they looked at Sprint, Sprint was moving up to 4G, investing, Sprint's got a great spectrum position. They were investing in their network. AT&T moving up to 4G, um, Verizon moving up to 4G, um, a lot of the regional carriers, Metro PCS moving up to 4G. So in order to remain competitive in this marketplace, T-Mobile said, you know, we can, we can invest 10 billion and stay and be competitive, or we can take the money, we can cash out, take the money and go build 4G broadband networks in Germany and in Europe and with some of our other subsidiaries. And that was their decision that they came down. And when you're, the German government is a 30% owner and they're the largest shareholder and they're saying, you know, invest in Germany, um, that was their decision. And so they weren't going to stay here and invest. Um, so their customers, their 34 million customers, didn't have a path to fourth generation. Um, and so the merger will allow those 34 million U.S. customers, U.S. residents, citizens, to have a path to fourth generation. Um, so the public interest test, uh, and the other piece of the public interest test is, that we're gonna argue, is that when we combine these two networks, um, not only will we combine the spectrum holdings, we'll also be able to combine the uh, cell sites and the networks, and that'll allow kind of greater coverage in large cities, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, um, get those cities into fourth generation but it'll also allow better coverage in, um, throughout the country. And so what we're gonna commit to in two days, we will commit to, and we've already talked about this publicly, we, we will commit to uh, building out 95% of the country with uh, fourth generation wireless broadband. So 95% of the population of the country will be controlled. And, and it looks like this, so that's the nationwide map. Um, but here's what it means for places like, this is West Virginia. So this is where we were going before, um, well, mostly the population centers. And then this is what allows us to do in West Virginia on a post basis. Um, so if you're in rural West Virginia and you don't have a wired broadband today, um, you're gonna get a wireless broadband experience by the time this merger's over. Um, and you know, this shows you what it can do in Texas so this is AT&T today, or where we were headed. This is like an 80% coverage map. This is, um, you know, 95% coverage. And so uh, the additional amount of geography that we'll be able to, uh, and we're also gonna put in $8 billion to get to this. So we get the spectrum, we get the network, we're gonna put another $8 billion in, and we'll end up with states covered like this. And to be able to get to that, um, the, ge the, the, the geographic difference on a nationwide basis is like four and a half times the state of Texas. So where we were headed at 80%, add another four and a half times the geography for the state of Texas, um, and that's where we're getting. So two public interests. Uh, uh, one, better for their customers, better for our customers. Two, 95% coverage. And, um, and if you go back to, uh, oops, where am I here? So this was um, Barack Obama in the State of the Union. He wanted 98% of Americans with wireless broadband coverage for the next five years. So essentially we're doing 95% in six years is what we're saying. Um, so we're getting pretty close. So those are the two public interests. Uh, that, that, helps, that helps your case. A this lot. helps our case, <laughs> right? This helps our case and it's the, uh, uh, I'm not gonna go there. So that's the coverage maps. And I'll, let me stop there and then we'll get into the antitrust piece. Anybody, public interest? You're ready to vote for it? You're a commissioner at the FCC. <laughs> I need three votes at the FCC. Well, surely there are gonna be people arguing against this. Stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. Verizon. Uh, Verizon's not gonna, they'll, they'll be, they're not gonna say anything. Sprint is uh, very opposed. Sprint will, be, Sprint will be the leading opponent. Some of the regional wireless. So, and would they argue that well, just, they could do this another way? This could be done another way. Well, just, just go back to this. So 
So this is Michigan after we built five years, six years from now. This is Michigan today. If you're a rural wireless carrier in kind of the upper peninsula of Michigan, do you think you're happy about this deal? Anybody? Yes? Happy? Unhappy? Why? Yeah, exactly right. So they're going to be down at the FCC, you know, being grumpy about this deal. But if you're a rural wireless <laughs> consumer in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, are you happy or unhappy? Right. So that's my so that's our pitch at the FCC, right? So the FCC will take in the Rural Wireless Carrier Association. will file. They'll file comments why this is a bad merger. They'll ask, you know, maybe they'll ask for a rejection of the merger. Maybe they'll ask for certain conditions that, you know, would apply to the merger. Um, you know, we need access or we need lower costs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they may ask for their own spectrum to be able to compete. Um, so, but, yeah, if you're a rural wireless carrier, you're going to be unhappy with this deal. But if you're a rural, rural wireless consumer, you know, yeah, Carter. Yeah, so that's a good segue into the next part, which is the competition. So uh, remember two hurdles, FCC public interest hurdle, DOJ, Department of Justice, has the antitrust hurdle impact on competition. <laughs> so um, so here's, this is what uh, T-Mobile was facing, right? They were looking at Verizon, they're going 4G, Sprint, it's got great spectrum. They're going 4G, Metro PCS, Sleep Wireless, Light Squared, US Cellular, Cell South, all these companies in the US. Different niches in the marketplace, right? And they're moving into 4G. So T-Mobile, uh, so they basically cash out their chips. Um, and so the way the Department of Justice has always looked at wireless mergers um, is they don't look at the national carrier Right? They don't look at uh, how many national carriers are in the marketplace. They look at it on a market-by-market market analysis. So, and think about it. If you're a consumer, um, that makes sense, right? Because if you're a consumer, you go into the wireless store, and you are, you wor you're worried about coverage at your house. You're worried about coverage at you know, Lafayette or where you work. You're worried about coverage on the way, right? But if you live in Washington, D.C., you're not necessarily worried about whether your carrier covers Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, right? You may be, you know, you may go to visit your grandmother once a year or something and you want to know that your wireless carrier works there. But for the most part, people make the decision on their local wireless, on their wireless carrier based on their local market. What's the local market coverage? What's the price? What's the coverage? What's the plan? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you do a market by market analysis, um, you know, this is kind of what it looks like today. And uh, these are in big cities. So New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Philadelphia, Detroit. So in, in Philadelphia, you have a choice of six competitors. Metro PCS, you know, we're there, Leap's there, Metro PCS, Sprint, you know, so on and so forth. So um, if, if I merge, if AT&T merges with T-Mobile um, in Philadelphia, there's still five competitors there. So our case at the Department of Justice will be, Look, in Philadelphia, how much competition do you need? We got, you know, you got me, and then you got four other competitors in Philadelphia. Um, and then it's the same in Los Angeles and Miami, Detroit, you know, so on. In, in uh, 18 out of the top 20 markets, there will be four or more competitors left, you know, after the merger. Does four sound like a good number? Does five sound like a good number? I mean, if there, you know, if there are four viable. So that's the case that we'll have to make in these markets. Now, there may be markets where uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice will be, so, you know, I don't have my, I do have Miami up here. So Miami, so Metro PCS, people don't think of Metro PCS as a uh, national carrier necessarily. They're a low-end regional carrier. But in Miami, they have 25% of the market because they've done a very good job of marketing to the folks in Miami. Um, so that's a viable competitor. 
Um, so we'll merge, but then we'll have Metro PCS, Sprint, Verizon, and us. So the customer kind of walking in, we'll see, um, you know, 25% of their friends will have Metro PCS. So they're, they're legit. So that's how the, the DOJ will go kind of market by market. And this is a, you know, this is a year long process um, and they'll get very granular. Um, and uh, that's how, that's how we go. And then, uh, did I leave? Yeah, so this is, and then here's some of the smaller, uh, you know, smaller cities, same thing, right? And I remember too, what did I say about T-Mobile? They were leaving the market, right? So things aren't as you, you know, wish they would be. You know, we got wish for five or six, you know, big strong competitors. T-Mobile, they, they were for sale. They were leaving the market. They weren't going to make the investment to stay competitive with a 4G generation. So if they're leaving the market, were they really going to be a long-term viable competitor, you know, in Wichita, Kansas? Um, maybe at the 3G level, maybe at the 2G level, but not at the 4G level. So they were leaving. Um, so, you know, this is, so this is a case that we're, we'll make the Department of Justice, yeah? Um, because they've told us. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean Sp Sprint, uh, well, let's see, the, the CEO for Sprint is already kind of out. He's very concerned, right? He's concerned about, um, uh, you know, competition in the market. He's concerned about a big, tough competitor, right? Um, he, he has a, uh, so he has a, you know, from his perspective, so, so part of this process will be, um, now he's a, he's out for a rejection. He would like to see a rejection of the deal, like to keep keep the two companies separate. Um, but as the process you know goes on, he may be angling for some sort of uh, condition on the deal, right? Some condition that benefits him, right? Or benefits his. Yeah. So there may be some spectrum holdings. Um, so <coughs> what'll happen is so there'll be some cities. So they'll do this market analysis, market by market analysis. There'll be some cities where the Department of Justice may say, okay, sorry, you know, this is going to be too concentrated in this market. And then they'll come to us and they'll say, if you want this deal to be approved, you have to divest yourself of, you know, Wichita or Blacksburg or whatever market that they find. Um, and then, so one of the people who will show up when we divest will probably be Sprint, right? Depending on if they have a, you know, if they have an interest in that market or be Metro PCS or... So actually this divestiture process will make some of these other carriers even stronger players in that market. So they'll say, okay, you know, AT&T, two, two, the two companies combined will be too strong in that market. We need you to divest. Um, and so there's a divestiture process which the Department of Justice oversees. Sprint may be very well be positioning themselves to come into that. Um, Verizon, you know, they haven't said anything. It's not... Uh, uh, well, they've, they've indicated that, they, that they're not going to challenge it. Um, they are, uh, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. They may be contemplating their own merger, you know, and, and um, they may want that process to go smoothly. Um, so, you know, there are different reasons for them, Pro, you know, presumably reasons that are beneficial to Verizon strategic reasons, <laughs> but yeah. And then, as I say, the rural guys, the rural wireless carriers, they'll be opposed. Um, you know, there are consumer, consumer union is, uh, they're concerned about it in terms of the price impact on consumers. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed somebody, yeah. So if you're, able, if you're allowed to merge uh, T-Mobile, then what, uh, what about if Verizon is allowed to merge Sprint, then they decide to merge? Yep, could, could happen, could happen. Um, and that's one of the concerns that people have raised. Again, though, uh, you have to look at the way things are, right? Um, so there's a couple of different concerns with Sprint. Sprint is kind of a unique player in, a, in the marketplace from a technology perspective. Um, and it's, there were a lot of rumors before our announcement with T-Mobile that Sprint and T-Mobile were thinking about merging. Um, and, because uh, remember, so T-Mobile had this problem, right? They had this problem in the US market and they, they had this asset and they essentially wanted to sell it before the asset, um, you know, became worth less, right? as they were losing customers, as they weren't being able to go to 4G. Um, so they, you know, presumably they looked at an, an IPO, right, spinning it off 
uh, as its own uh, company. There was probably some capital issues with that. They would still have this capital issue of being able to invest and, and keep up with everybody else. Um, but, and again, you know, we don't have a lot of insight, but, the, but you know, the financial press was kind of, there were rumors that Sprint was uh, thinking about buying T-Mobile. The problem with uh, that combination is there's actually uh, a couple different uh, standards, so, uh, uh, phone standards. So our network uh, and T-Mobile's network are very compatible. We're the same kind of technology. It's called HSP, HSPA or GSM is the older standard. Um, Sprint and uh, Verizon are uh, two different technologies. Uh, I'm sorry, Sprint and uh, T-Mobile were two different technologies. And so I don't know if people remember the Sprint Nextel merger. Two different technologies were involved in that. They had a heck of a time kind of merging the two. Um, and, you know, most folks are in the industry, uh, you know, there's a real concern about that process. So, uh, you know, Sprint going through another process like that with T-Mobile, kind of swapping the two uh, technologies to get them compatible was going to be a tougher deal for them. So, but yes, Verizon could, could come in. They could, you know, make that purchase and then the regulators would be sitting there looking at, you know, is this too much? Um, probably wouldn't be good, you know, if that happened while we were trying to get this approved. Um, and there are concerns, right, that people um, make about that. Um, the good news is that Sprint has, has done a lot to improve itself in the last, you know, two years. And again, this, this business turns around very quickly. Five years ago, Sprint, Timo, AT&T, and Verizon were roughly kind of equal. Um, we were helped by the iPhone, and Verizon had a merger with Altel, and there's been some other changes, but it's a rapidly changing marketplace. And so Sprint, they got a new CEO, former AT&T guy, uh, Dan Hesse, um, about two, th two and a half years ago. And so they have been, you know, on a tear as of late. They finally got themselves some good smartphones. They got some very aggressive pricing, you know, um, and it, as you know, you know, it's a one-year, two-year contract. Some people are no contract. So every time it comes up, you can kind of reevaluate the marketplace and, you know, share shifts. Sprint has 50 million customers. Um, it's more than their population of France, right? They're, they're one of the top 100 companies in the country. They're not a small company. So, um, you know, they're a viable competitor and uh, with a good future. Um, so this is, I think this is the last slide. So pricing. So what happens with mergers and pricing? So this is my favorite chart, right? Um, this shows you the consolidation on the wireless side in the industry. And so, you know, Bell Atlantic, GT, AirTouch, this is a 10-year chart. Uh, SBC, Bell South, Singular, Singular, AT&T, Wireless Sprint. This is not the first, wire, point is, this is not the first wireless merger in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so what this does, uh, this is uh, labor statistics, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so wireless prices have consistently gone down, right? Now this is a voice chart, um, and you saw the data, trend, the data trends are much more recent, right? But we're seeing the same trends on the data side too. Um, and so why is this? Guesses? Anybody have a guess? Why do, yeah. <laughs> Economies of scale, absolutely, right? Economies of scale, and in a competitive marketplace, economies of scale get passed on to the consumer, right? Um, another guess, yeah? Also, if, um, if you're adding uh, more depth to the range of, of service to people, you're potentially getting like more, more customers, so you can... Yep, you're, you're getting more customers over your uh, investment, and so you can, you know, you have a fixed cost investment to get more customers over, so you're you know, your price per unit goes down again. It's kind of an economies of scale, absolutely. There's also, um, what's happened to technology the last 10 years? I think it's gotten more expensive or cheaper? Cheaper, right? Technology gets cheaper all the time. And um, so again, in a competitive marketplace, the price of your inputs, if your price of your inputs are going down, um, those cost savings get passed on to your consumers, right? So, so this is mostly economies of scale and cost of technology. Um, and so, and we feel that this will continue. Um, and, and so the upshot of this is that the U.S., we are talking, Darlene was talking about the, the price of phone service in Spain. I mean, uh, the U.S. leads the world in, uh, you know, lowest cost per bit, 
lowest cost per voice, mo per voice minute. And so as a result, highest usage, right? Highest usage. If it doesn't cost a lot, then you use it a lot more. Um, and so I will stop. 50% decline in price is pretty uh, impressive. Uh, I can leave it there. This is actually, so just to your point, I mean, so what are the social benefits? And we'll argue this as well. Um, and this is my Pew. We were talking about the Pew Internet. So, um, so what we find is, particularly uh, if you don't have a lot of money, um, and now you you know you have a choice between buying a wireline, you know, putting broadband in your home or putting broadband in your cell phone in your hand, um, you you choose broadband in your hand, right? Um, because that's a more more value to you. Because now you're getting entertainment, you're getting communication, you're getting so on and so forth. So, the um, so this on ramp, ramp for the internet, people talk about the digital divide. If everybody, if 95 percent of, the, and this is why you know President Obama is interested in it, right? If 95 percent of the country has access to four, fourth generation broadband, um, it'll be a lot cheaper for everybody to get on at some level, right? And you know that. So AT and T, you know, on the iPhone, I think we came out. Initially, with a uh, the 3G phone was maybe a $300 device. We now have it in the market for 50 bucks, 50 bucks, and a uh, $15 a month data plan. So that's a pretty good value. Um, all right, that's it. extent is Congress involved in this? In the sense, because I mean, they are an independent agency, but are they getting pressure from Congress? I mean, are you yeah, so lobbying Congress at the yep. same time? Yeah. So we'll have um, we'll have uh, I've already, we already have two hearings scheduled, right? That will look at just this transaction, May 11th, Senate Judiciary Committee, the Antitrust Subcommittee. When Congress comes back from recess. Um, they'll have a hearing. On the uh, on the merger, um, and then we'll get a hearing in the uh, Judiciary Committee in the House. Again, antitrust. So the Judiciary Committees have the antitrust jurisdiction, and then the Commerce Committees have the telecommunications jurisdiction. So we'll probably end up with four hearings, and so those members of Commerce, the Congress, will they'll you know will make the same arguments that I've just made here. They sound convincing. Everybody convinced? Everybody skeptical? Um, anyway, uh, we'll make, you know, our CEO will come in, he'll testify, he'll make pretty much the same arguments that I've just made to you here, um, and, uh, and they'll have their own opinions. And some of them may write to the FCC, some of them may call the FCC, some of them will ask for more information, um, but yeah, they'll have their own, they'll have their own opinions. Yeah, you've got to work that side. Absolutely, of the yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, broad, so uh, telecommunications has traditionally been, you know, really since the '30s, has been very heavily regulated, right? That we, the, the government, essentially in the '30s, cut a deal with AT and T to say, we'll give you the right to build out to be the only provider of telephone service throughout the country, and in return. <laughs> We'll regulate you. We'll regulate the price. We'll regulate. You know, it's, it was a mono, AT and T was a monopoly, and it was regulated. Um, uh, and that lasted really till the early '80s. The MFJ, uh, Judge Green, and um, so it's always had this tradition. And and really, the deal was cut because I think the regulators felt, and the public felt, the kind of the public good was, you know, everybody needs a phone. Phone should be a basic right. Right, universal service should be available and it should be cheap. So let's figure out a way to do it. And, um, and so that's how that was the way that they did it. And so now the question is, so that's always been, kind of, so now the question is, you know, is the internet kind of the same? And we're still really grappling, right? Is the internet kind of, the, should, be, should that be the same basic right kind of going forward? And, and then if the internet is, or broadband is, you know, should wireless broadband, same thing, right? Should that be? 
do we still just need the regular phone? Should that be the basic minimum right? Um, or do we need this kind of next generation? And, and we're really still kind of having that debate, right? Um, and, uh, and we'll probably will have it for a while. But until, until that's resolved by a new statute or, you know, we'll, have, we'll go through this regulatory process. here, we were having lunch and I was telling him we were going to run an election uh, contest on forecasting the election outcomes. And Peter said, oh, well, uh, I said, well, do you have any ideas for a prize? He said, well, I'll get, I'll get tickets to the inaugural ball <laughs> to the inauguration. But I think little did he know that after President Obama won how hard that was going to be. But he came through and lo and behold, Darlene Cerullo won out of about 150 students, won that competition of predicting, forecasting the 2008 election. So today she deserves the last, and went to the ball and went to the inauguration. She has the last word. Okay. Well, on behalf of the class, <laughs> and myself in particular, we want to thank you for being right. here today. No, thank you very much, Charlene. Really I appreciate it. Thanks.